In this installment of our video analysis series, we're going to evaluate two versions of a very common exercise, the forward lunge. In one version, the trunk remains upright and the lead knee is positioned behind the subject's toe at the bottom or transition point of the movement. In the other version, the body inclines forward in order to position the center of gravity closer to the front foot and the knee is allowed to project forward so long as his heel remains on the ground. To aid in our evaluation, we're using an instrumented foot plate which measures the force, magnitude, and direction. And what we'll see is that these two variations yield quite different and sometimes surprising results which could affect the way we utilize them. So let's begin with the upright version. As you can see, the subject lunges forward and then settles into a vertical posture at the bottom of the movement. He generates a force of 122 pounds at a 9 degree angle off the foot plate. Now, our subject weighs about 175 pounds. So right from the start, there's a considerable amount of weight on his back foot. And this could really affect the dynamics of this exercise. The real effects, though, stem from the torques which load the individual joints. Joint torques are the product of the magnitude of the force and the perpendicular distance from the line of force to the center of the joints. As you can see, the subject generates about 185 foot-pounds of torque at the hip, 50 foot-pounds at the knee, and 30 foot-pounds at the ankle. It's not quite balanced torque loading, especially between the hip and the knee, but it is effective at reducing the loading at the knee joint and potentially decreasing the stress on the joint. Now, typically, lunge assessments begin and end with this position. But interestingly, this is not the point at which peak force is generated, so we really should look at that moment in time as well. As the subject pushes off the plate, he achieves peak force moments after he begins his upward motion. At this point, he's generating 160 pounds of force at a 12 degree angle off the plate. This translates into increased loading at the hip and the knee, as you can see here, but not at the ankle. So the plantar flexors are doing no additional work throughout this phase of the movement. In fact, if you watch our subject's lead foot, you'll see that he rolls back onto his heel as he moves backwards. This is the primary result of having his weight too far back at the bottom of the movement. The problem is that he has now eliminated his plantar flexors from the action, which limits the benefit of the exercise for a muscle group that is critical to propulsion. So now let's observe the incline version of the lunge to see how things differ. This time, our subject continues to move forward and down until at the transition point his trunk and shank angles are nearly parallel and his weight is farther forward. He generates a vertical force of 153 pounds and if you look carefully you'll see that the force is centered over the ball of the foot instead of the instep which is where it emanated from in the previous movement. All of these factors combine to produce a different torque profile, which we can see here. In comparing the joint torques in this position to the upright version, we can see that the load on the hip is identical. But there is a greater hip flexion angle. Remember that the trunk was upright in the former version. So this creates a greater pre-stretch of the glutes with potentially greater muscle activation. There is a significant increase in torque at the knee. In fact, it's nearly tripled. So there's an increased potential for knee stress, primarily in patellar compressive loading. On the other hand, there is a better balance between the hip and the knee in the torques that are produced. Lastly, but equally important, is the torque at the ankle. Notice that the 80 foot-pounds is nearly triple that of the upright position meaning that the calf muscles are significantly more involved at this point in the motion. As we transition into the moment of peak force output, we can see 
that our subject generated 175 pounds at a 12 degree angle. That's 15 pounds more force than was generated in the upright version of this exercise. The resulting torque profile reveals that there's over 50 foot-pounds more load at the hip in this position than in the upright position. And interestingly, there are 20 foot-pounds less load at the knee. There is a small drop-off in torque at the ankle, but there's still more than twice as much torque at the ankle in this position as there was in the upright position. Lastly, as we follow the transition backwards, we can see that the push-off comes from the ball of the foot and not the heel, which keeps the plantar flexors active much longer through the movement. So, which version of the exercise is better? Well, the answer to that is it depends. If you want to limit the load at the knee, especially in the lowered position, with reduced muscular demands at the hip and the ankle, then you might want to select the upright version. But if you want greater loading and potential power development with highly active musculature at the hip, knee, and ankle, and you can tolerate increased knee loads at the lowered position, then you want to choose the incline version. In either case, knowing how these exercises work empowers you to make better decisions.